Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Environmental Justice in the Latinx Community, a virtual event sponsored by the Duke Human Rights Center at Franklin Humanities Institute, the Keenan Institute for Ethics, Duke Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, and the Program in Latino Latina Studies in the Global South at Duke University. My name is Corinne Saragosa, and I am the Program Coordinator at the Duke Human Rights Center. Forty years ago, a predominantly Black community in Warren County, North Carolina, rallied against hosting a hazardous waste landfill. These protests are widely recognized as the beginning of the environmental justice movement, and here at Duke University, we have been honoring this anniversary with a series of events such as this one. Today, we focus on the effects of environmental racism in the Latino community. We have with us Stephanie Elizondo Greist and Brian Barras, who will explain their work with environmental justice, mm -hmm. discuss specific issues facing the Latinx community, and provide suggestions for ways that people can get involved. Our moderator for tonight's discussion is Ana Ramirez Calderon. She graduated from Duke with a BA in Environmental Sciences and Policy and Religious Studies. During her undergraduate career, she co-founded Duke Define America, an immigrant student advocacy group, and was co-president of Mi Gente, Duke's Latinx Student Association. Ana's academic passion lies at the intersection of environmental justice, spirituality, and human rights. She has always found unique ways to engage all three, like participating in Duke Engage Kauai, Duke in Alaska, and Bass Connections. She currently serves as a Spark Fellow in Duke's Office of Undergraduate Education. She works with Sophomore Spark, a new initiative that provides a coordinator approach to supporting sophomore students. Originally from Guayaquil, Ecuador, Ana immigrated to the United States with her family in 2001 and has called Hollywood, Florida her hometown ever since. I'm going to pass it off to Ana. Thank you for being with us here today. Gracias, Corin. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. As you probably know, September 15th to October 15th marks the beginning of Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month, a time where we celebrate the histories, the cultures, and the contributions of those whose ancestors came from the Caribbean, Central and South America, Mexico, and Spain. It's truly a beautiful time to see all eyes on our culture and our customs. But this month isn't just about the beauty of it all. It's also about the advocacy, the hard work, the recognition, and the justice that our gente, our people have fought for and deserve. And tonight, I'm very fortunate to be able to introduce two wonderful individuals who have a legacy of doing just that. First, we are going to hear from Stephanie Elizondo Greist. She is a globetrotting author from the Texas Mexico borderlands. Her five books include the memoirs Around the Block, Mexican Enough, and All the Agents and Saints. She has also written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Believer, and Oxford American. Among her honors are a Hodder Fellowship at Princeton and a Margoli Award for Social Justice Reporting. Currently, she is an Associate Professor of Creative Nonfiction at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Stephanie, bienvenida. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm, I'm really deeply honored to be here, especially with, uh, with Brian Barras, who uh, is a friend from long ago and also such a vital activist in our community. Thank you so much, Brian, for all that you have done for my own home state of Texas. Thank you for that. Wow. So, hey, everybody, um, I, am, <laughs> I am going to do a share screen. I made a PowerPoint for you to uh, use to share a little bit about my work. So, boom. Okay. So hopefully we can all see this now. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about environmental injustice, eco-injustice and the borderlands, which is where I'm from. Um, more specifically, I'm actually, I feel like I tr my true homeland is this dividing line in between. Um, my mother is, my mother has roots in Mexico. My father is Kansan. Uh, so I grew up in a half white, half brown community. And I have spent my entire literary career and also just my entire existential life trying to figure out what it means when a borderline slices right through you. And uh, my hometown is Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, all you need to know about Corpus is right here in this image. All of our, all the best things we have to offer. We got seagulls, snow cones, the sea, and of course, Selena. Yes. Um, but growing up in South Texas, I uh, 
quickly realized that I wanted to not maybe not spend my life in South Texas. Um, and one very major reason for that is this image right here. Um, Corpus Christi is surrounded by 15 miles of petrochemical industries. Um, all of my theos work there. Um, a lot of my family members work there. And I could see the toll that it took on them to do this really dangerous, really, really hard work. And um, so what happened with me is um, I somehow managed to go to this journalism convention when I was in high school. And this four correspondent got up and told the most incredible stories that I'd ever heard. Um, he had witnessed the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall. He'd seen these riots and revolution and coup d'etat. And the entire time he was talking, I was thinking like, this man's job will get me out of South Texas. So when he was done with his oratory, he's like, who's got a question for me? And I raised my hand. I said, I do, I wanna be you, what do I do? And he said, learn Russian. Wild advice, yes, <laughs> especially when you're like half Mexican and you can't even talk to your Rolita. So I, uh, but it was specific advice. So I, so I did. And uh, in 1996, I moved to Moscow, and it was quite a time in in Russia. In particular, I became really uh, involved in in youth issues affecting young people. Um, there were at that time like over a million homeless youth in un unhoused youth in Russia. Um, and uh, I started working in children's shelters and uh, very quickly began wondering, like, what is, what is it I am doing here? Um, and, and more specifically, what skills do I have that can come about addressing these really grave social justice problems that I was seeing all around me? And so um, and I, I think it's important for all of us to just sort of evaluate that. Right. I mean, we are seeing in real time uh, the effects of so many uh, catastrophes uh, that are happening is particularly in the environment. And, um, and so, you know, how can we sort of honestly evaluate what we ourselves can offer? And so, you know, when I first got to Russia, I was like, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not this, I'm not that. Um, all I had been trained to do in my, in my, you know, 19 years of life up to that point was take notes. But I'm like, if I'm going to take notes, I'm going to do it the best I can, right? So, uh, so what I started doing was um, sitting on my cot at the end of each day and just really thinking, like, okay, what did I see today? What did I smell today? What did I overhear? What did I taste? What did I touch? Just really doing this sort of um, uh, this this little nightly ritual. Initially, it was ten minutes, but by the time I left uh, Russia. Um, as you can see, uh, it, 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 it stretched. <laughs> uh, and before long, I was spending hours a day taking notes on everything that I saw. And that continued as I began traveling, uh, not only in Russia, but I began traveling to uh, actually throughout the former Soviet Union. I went to the Baltic nations. Um, I went to Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. Um, I eventually got another fellowship, moved to China and uh, began taking mad notes there. And really, but it all just really started from this very simple ritual that I began to realize was my own form of activism, um, the activism of witness, the activism of, of documentation. Um, and, and, I, and I share this with you just to sort of state that we can evaluate any job that we have, we can use it toward the path of justice. And so this just happened to be like my, my own interest and skill set happen to be notes and that is what i've tried to do toward justice um so so we can all just take an opportunity to do that think about what we can do so anyway so taking all of these notebooks um worth of notes as witness uh, eventually evolved into books and i want to focus in particular on um what happened with uh, my most recent book all the agents and saints and how that came about is um after having spent you know over a decade just traveling all around the world and doing a lot of documentation uh, finally, in my early 30s, I got the magnetic pull home. And uh, in particular, you know, having learned other languages, I began to feel some sadness that I had yet to learn Spanish, learn my own, my own language. I had yet to connect to my own people where I was from. And so I came back to South Texas and was really shocked with what had happened um, in my absence. Uh, essentially, South Texas had become in my, in a, a death valley. The Rio Grande Valley had become a death valley. Um, of course, you, you know, in my absence, uh, the border wall had been erected, which has caused um, almost unimaginable suffering, human suffering at the border. 
um, climate change had made it and, and immigration policy had made it such that um, South Texas was literally a graveyard. So many people were dying as they were crossing um, back and forth from uh, crossing the border. Um, also, Corpus Christians, like their bodies look different. Um, and in fact, right around the time that I came home after having been gone for a long time, Corpus Christi had just been named uh, the most obese city in the United States. And, um, and so I began after having, you know, kind of trained in documentation um, in Russia and China, Cuba, you know, so many other nations, I then turned that into my own homeland uh, to see what I could find. And, uh, you know, again, just I found a lot of really, really, really hard stories. Um, this, this is one, one man I've really spent quite a bit of time, Liana Lopez, who runs the South Texas Colonia Initiative. Colonias are um, unincorporated communities that line, uh, that they're all throughout South Texas. They don't get federal funding. Um, the organizations he works with because they are just a little too far from the border to, to apply for a certain type of funding that would um, give them a better standard of living than they have. As you can see from the photos, it is uh, pretty desperate conditions. Um, a particular note is uh, they can't actually use their water wells. Most people in these communities, the water wells have long been poisoned and um but they also can't afford to get other other water systems running and so what a lot of people do in, in this really foul water is mix it with kool-aid um which has led to other uh, other health problems um so you know I, I began seeing really difficult things like this um and then also of course by virtue of oh and now it's my okay and then by um after researching that story, I then took another step back and was like, okay, now I need to think about the reasons that I really initially wanted to go, um, wanted to leave my homeland in the first place was of course, all of these refineries. And that led me to meeting this incredible woman, Susie Canales, who works for Citizens for Environmental Justice. And um, I'm gonna take a second just to read you um, a little bit about what this work is like and how she herself got into it. Again, just sort of thinking, um, you know, one of the questions we'll be addressing toward the end of the panel is, you know, what can we do um, to be to be a supporter of this movement, the environmental justice movement? And I'll, I'll tell you how it happened for Susie Canales. Um, so she, like me, left South Texas, came back when her her sister, who she was very close to, died of breast cancer when she was only 42 years old. And I'm going to describe a scene at the funeral. Friends descended upon them, rosaries wrapped around their wrists. I is so young. You know, my niece has breast cancer too. Neighbors she hadn't seen in years. My sister died of breast cancer last year. She was even younger than Diana, only 35. Former classmates. I heard three of your sisters got hysterectomies. Me too, and I'm just 38. The service blurred into a fog of grief. Remember my little brother? He passed away. My big brother too. Yes, they had cancer, both of them. Before departing the funeral home, Susie's family gathered in a huddle. Did anybody notice all that talk of cancer? They had. Someone started compiling a list of the dead. The names quickly filled two pieces of paper. By the time they grabbed a third, they vowed to investigate. First, they ran an ad in the thrifty nickel asking local residents to contact them if anyone in their family had cancer. Within days, they were fielding calls about teenage girls undergoing hysterectomies. The local CBS affiliate noticed their ad as well and rang them for details. Though nervous about public speaking, Susie agreed to a slot in the evening news. Soon her telephone was ringing incessantly. Susie typed up a health survey she found on the internet, ran off hundreds of copies and distributed them to her brothers and sisters. They found out in their neighborhood, knocking on every door, and returned with stories not only of cancer, but of birth defects and immunodeficiency diseases as well. People complained of migraine headaches, of asthma attacks, of nosebleeds. Meanwhile, Susie started researching the history of the area and learned it used to be littered with oil and gas production companies. Pipelines ran right beneath their old neighborhood. She combed through property records. She searched through city planning archives. She flipped through volume upon volume of minutes from meetings of the railroad commission, the city council and the school board, not even knowing what she was looking for until one afternoon at the office of planning commission when she found the minutes from a 1942 meeting devoted to the topic, what to do with the Negroes. The solution 
race zoning ordinances that place the city's African-American population in neighborhoods adjacent to the ship channel, right where the oil refineries were then being built. Daihanos, meanwhile, were zoned by oil waste dumps that had been repurposed as landfills, including the one bordering Susie's old neighborhood. Greenwood, it turned out, Greenwood, it turned out, had been built atop a 47-acre hazardous waste dump. When Susie and her classmates marched around during band practice after school, they were hovering over uh, covered oil pits, okay? So these are the kind of stories that I was documenting um, for about seven years and um, really, really hard, hard stories to hear, as you can imagine. Oops. So, Okay, and uh, so through doing this kind of work, um, I began to develop a, a code of ethics um, that I, I actually started, to, I developed this pretty early on in my practice, things like, you know, learning the local language, trying to live the life of the people that you write about, uh, knowing and really believing that your subjects are right, treating them accordingly, sharing your work with them. You know, so I had this sort of code of ethics, but I think the most important ethic that's maybe relevant to this discussion today that I came to know through writing this book was number seven, which is know that injustice eventually comes for you. And to, um, so to end my little presentation for you, I'm gonna read to you what happened when I actually went on book tour for this book, All the Agents and Saints. Two weeks into my tour, my abdomen started aching. Eating induced a sensation of fullness inside my chest. Acid reflux scorched my throat. I attributed all of this to the celebratory enchilada platters that I was devouring until the morning I woke up bleeding. A doctor placed her hands in my belly. She asked if I was pregnant. Not a chance, I said. Are you sure? I thought for a moment, then joked, well, I am Catholic. She dispatched me to a radiologist. Her eyes grew round as she snapped image after image after image. My ovaries had indeed bred something, only it wasn't a child. It was a tumor the size of an oblong basketball. After years of hearing tumor horror stories in borders north and south, I had grown my own. So big, surgeons had to remove two liters of fluid before they could pull it out of me. When I woke from the procedure, the oncologist sadly informed me I had received a hysterectomy. In that moment, however, the thought of losing a hypothetical child wasn't nearly as painful as the reality of abandoning a book that had just been published. When can I fly, I asked. Six weeks, the oncologist said. That meant canceling nearly 20 events, but maybe I could still present at the Texas Book Festival. That became my recovery goal. Yet an outfit called the tumor board was still examining what my ovaries had grown. A week later, the oncologist called to say the tumor was cancerous. Fewer than half of the women diagnosed with ovarian cancer survive even five years. I would undergo chemotherapy as soon as I recovered from surgery. How could this be? My family had no history of ovarian cancer. Extensive genetic testing yielded no predisposition for it either. I was a 43-year-old yoga practitioner who mostly ate tofu and kale, unless taqueria was nearby. My major risk factor seemed to be the polluted environment where I grew up. This theory gained traction when I learned my childhood next door neighbor had just been diagnosed with breast cancer. Never had I felt so connected to my homeland as I did when a nurse wearing a makeshift hazmat suit inserted an IV into the port sewn inside my chest so that Taxol and carboplatin could flow inside my veins. So um, that is, I think, something that we really can't think about enough uh, in terms of where we are heading with the environmental injustice, right? It's, it's um, eventually, it is indeed heading its way toward us. And um, I'm gonna show something very graphic. So feel free to monitor what you're seeing. Um, I'm just gonna show it because I, I can't tell you how many times I actually have heard stories um, in all of the environmental justice stories that I've covered over the years about tumors. Um, so I wanna show you what it actually looks like. That was mine. Um, this was me in the ceremony to shave my head to prepare for chemotherapy. And that is me as a cancer survivor. All right, thank you so much.
Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing your work and your stories. Um, and we'll come back to Stephanie's work shortly. Um, now I want to introduce to you all Brian Faras. Brian's going to talk about his work and um, the work that he does as well. So Brian is a Houston resident and co-founder of Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Service, or Tejas. Brian is an environmental justice advocate who currently serves as a campaign representative in the Environmental and Climate Justice Program Department of the Sierra Club, which is a grassroots environmental organization um, across the country. So Brian, Brian, bienvenido. Thank you. And uh, and thank you for sharing your, your story, Stephanie. It's uh, pretty incredible to think, uh, you know, when we met, um, you were touring your first book in Houston and like knew that you were from Corpus, but had no clue, right? Like we had no idea where our journey would take us. Uh, and we've kind of come full circle. I, I grew up in Houston and I've been sort of sharing my time with two tracks. Um, one, one being with Tejas. Texas Environmental mm -hmm. Justice Advocacy Services. And, and that one is very much, you know, personal work because of, of my background, where I grew up and where my parents grew up. Um, and the other one is with a, an organization called Nuestra Palabra, Latino writers having their say. And, and that's how I was introduced to, to Stephanie. Um, it's an organization that promotes Latino, Latina, Latinx literature. Uh, this was before there was Latinx, so <laughs> you know, forgive, uh, forgive the the title and the names. Um, we're always all learning and growing, and it was often difficult to to know how to how to blend those two worlds together, right? Um, and I think what what's beautiful is Stephanie has has helped show me how it can be done in a really beautiful way and in a personal way. Um, and I, I I just want to say I think we need more of that writing. Um, and and I wish I could do <laughs> some writing too. Um, but uh, but my my track you know has been and my journey's been a little different. I. Uh, I'm going to share with y'all a short video that I did um, while I was working at Houston Community College, and it is a digital story. Um, this beautiful program that uh, was hosted by the Story Center, um, and you know, I I've worked with video. That's kind of been my medium for helping show uh, and document and archive. And, and tell the story. Because uh, oftentimes, you know, when we are discussing mm -hmm. environmental issues, uh, you just see people's eyes glaze over. <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. And, and it's, uh, you know, really hard to describe um, what is really happening. And, and I found over the years that visuals, you know, had a greater impact uh, on people um, and then individual photos turned into, you know, video, because uh, I started, you know, doing this work in the late 1990s um, and in the early 2000s, just as the internet was, you know, really beginning to flourish and digital media was developing, becoming more accessible um, and distribution, you know, uh, pathways were being created. Uh, so, so I, I, I did independent journalism type work uh, for a number of years, um, but it's always been, you know, advocacy. It's always been for the purpose of trying to change a situation and to show, you know, the, the vast uh, inequities and disparities that, that exist. Um, and while you do that, I'll just, uh, I'll just continue. Um, yeah, so I grew up in Houston, about two and a half miles from the beginning of the of the Houston Ship Channel, um, and it sounds like you know <laughs> Corpus Christi and Houston have a lot, a lot in common, and they do. You know, they're both uh, very much petro petrochemical 
cities. Um, Houston has about a 18, 20 mile stretch of refineries and chemical plants. Um, and I've read in, in some books, I think Alan Weissman, uh, World Without Us, has, has said that Houston has the largest uh, complex of refineries, chemical plants, pipelines, storage tanks, rail, you know, the complete infrastructure for oil and gas and petrochemicals um, in the world. And, and so that's, uh, that's something that a lot of people don't think about um, and, and what the consequences are. So I'll let you play this real quick. My parents grew up in the Permian Basin Petro Patch. My dad lived in a small town called Big Spring. When I was little, we would go back there every year for the holidays. I always thought that it was a funny name because it wasn't that big to me. It was also strange because we couldn't drink the faucet water either. Every so often, I'd forget and take a big gulp from the tap and gag from the awful taste. My mom grew up just a few miles away in a farming community of Forsan. She was a cheerleader for the high school and their mascot was the buffalo. We used to drive through Forsan on our way to Big Spring and I always knew when we were getting close because the air started to stink like a bad fart. Me and my brother would try to hold our breath till we drove past the stench. Sometimes I'd get headaches and start to feel nauseous, but my mom said it was because I was holding my breath. My parents eventually left West Texas to make a better life and start a family in the Petro Metro. They bought a house in East Houston just off of Telephone Road and just a few miles from Buffalo Bayou. I didn't think too much about it when I was a kid, but I grew up in a city with the largest concentration of refineries and petrochemical facilities in the world. Every morning, I wipe the dew and oily residue off the car windows with a paper towel. There was a little bayou by my house. That was my only connection to nature. But I never got to go on camping trips with the boys club like my dad did as a kid. Today, I'm an organizer and an advocate for environmental justice for all of the young children still holding their breath. All right. Thank you <laughs> for that, Corin. Um, yeah. So I, uh, I started to realize that this was, you know, more than a problem for, for myself. Right. And that this was even like a generational problem that existed in, in my family. Um, and at each phase of, you know, fossil fuel development from extraction you know, even to exploration um, and extraction, um, processing, delivering, transporting, and then refining. You know, there's uh, communities that are just ripped, ripped apart, um, land stolen, water polluted, um, air contaminated, um, and soil, right, left with legacy contamination that can last for decades and decades. And uh, as, as Stephanie said, you know, it will come for you. <laughs> um, and, and that really scares me, right? It scares me because uh, I've spent majority of my life in very toxic places um, covering this and living in it. Um, and, uh, and it's hard, it's hard work. It's uh, emotional work, and it is very difficult, you know, to feel like you're you're doing something that is having an impact. Um, 
and and what I what I have tried to do, you know, I think uh, in in the last five to ten years, um, is shift into policy work, you know, at the federal level uh, to try and change some of the rules and highlight communities who have contributed least, you know, to, to these problems, um, but have been suffering the most from the consequences of, of this industry and, and the impact that it's had on the climate. Um, and that's, that's kind of where I'm at now, you know, when we think about Hurricane Harvey, you know, that hit both of our, our homes, um, you know, the major, the major story, you know, was the fallout from the fossil fuel industries, uh, the incredible amounts of toxic chemicals that were released into the air, into the water. And, you know, people, people live next to these facilities and uh, people are unable to evacuate um, when they hit. And once they hit, you know, you're, you're sitting duck, you're at the mercy of nature, you're at the mercy of, you know, the, the infrastructure around you, you're at the mercy of so many other, other things um, that make your situation worse because of, of structural, you know, racism. Um, so that, that's kind of been, you know, my place, like, right in the middle of all of these things unfolding. And I, I can remember, you know, when I was in high school, the river, San Jacinto River catching fire um, because of a, a flood event that came through Houston and caused a, a pipeline to rupture and then was ignited. Um, and burning rivers is, is why the Environmental Protection Agency was created in the first place. And it's still, you know, still happening. Um, and things have, uh, have gotten even more consequential. Um, but, uh, but I'll, I'll stop there. And, you know, I'm really interested in hearing, you know, some questions from the audience and, and yourself. Wonderful. So it looks like we uh, we lost Anna. Hopefully she will um, come back soon. We're having some not wonderful weather here in North Carolina, so hopefully she'll be back um, back soon. But um, I'm happy to um, ask you both some questions and and hear your both your thoughts on and your perspectives on on some of these questions, and then we'll open it up to um, the attendees to give their questions as well. Um, so my first question, uh, 40 years ago, a predominantly Black community in Warren County, North Carolina, rallied against hosting a hazardous waste landfill, which of course began the environmental justice movement. Um, and as many people here know, of course, um, environmental racism disproportionately affects both Black and Latino communities. Um, but in what ways are Latino communities affected that Black communities are not? And how can both groups work together to fight um, in environmental justice? Yeah, wow. I'll take a stab and then does that sound good? Okay. Yeah, so thinking about that, that's really intense. So I think it's like three in five Black and Latino people live near a toxic waste site. So um, it's it's a profound issue for, for both communities. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I wonder if you would agree with this, Brian, sometimes I think about, um, I mean, if we think about where the climate crisis is the most severe in the world, it's really in, in the places, as I think you mentioned, the places that are least responsible for it, um, particularly Central America, Guatemala, Salvador, and uh, so the migration um, at the southern border just in the last year, the statistic was just released like a week ago, 2 million people have been arrested crossing the border. So we are already seeing like unprecedented migration. And some of that is from, um, from gangs, but a lot of that is actually, um, most of the people that my friends have personally interviewed, um, they're, they're more talking about uh, the, the, the total economic collapse because of the climate, that the climate is ruined 
so much of the land. And that's also um, why a lot of migrants, um, you know, if you think, if you look at the span of migration, when migration, um, when, when the numbers just looking, you know, throughout like US history, when the numbers really, really shot up, it was right after the passage of NAFTA, um, where uh, farmers in Mexico were suddenly being outpriced by farmers in Iowa, simply because the Iowan farmers had um, corn subsidies and the Mexican farmers didn't. And so they had to allow their farms to go fallow. And so then, um, then, then people began to, to migrate up northward. Um, so, so I think that is a major, um, so, so, so just thinking about the causes, I mean, I think both communities were actually literally zoned into living in these places and, or, um, companies came into those places because they were disenfranchised. Um, but I think that maybe Latinos have like the legacy of, of, um, you know, more, um, the majority of environmental activists that are killed are being killed in Latin America. Um, so I think that's maybe something that affects them. Also, so many of the reports that come out about these environmental issues are never actually translated into Spanish. So I think that there's a problem of people maybe not even realizing what's happening or not knowing the extent of what's happening. I mean, only now is the, has there even been like a move to get some of these state environmental agencies to even publish these reports in, in, in a language that the people that are living in the neighborhoods can actually feel. So anyway, that's what I got. What do you think, Brian? <laughs> I think he said a lot. You hit on a lot of uh, main points. And, you know, the question is really interesting and it can be read in different ways, right? Um, what we don't want is, is to compare communities and have, uh, you know, a, uh, an oppression Olympics, right? Like who's got it worse? Um, but it is important to understand the distinctions, right? Of how each of our communities are being targeted, right? Intentionally. So Stephanie mentioned redlining um, that has impacted both our communities. Um, and then she's mentioned, you know, a number of issues that are specific to Latin America, right? And migrants, climate refugees, you know, coming into the US because of the massive disruption uh, from American and Canadian companies, right? Doing the mining, doing the drilling in, in their homelands um, and polluting the water and making their way of life impossible. Um, forcing them into the cities first, right? Um, where then they become uh, vulnerable to gangs uh, and other you know, predatory institutions. Um, let's not forget that gangs were exported to Latin America from the U.S. too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, let's not ignore the fact that U.S. is um, sending illegal arms to <laughs> these countries as well. Um, so there's there's a lot. There's a lot. Right. And I think, you know, there's also a distinction between blacks, African-Americans and then African migrants that are coming. Right or Haitian migrants that are coming um, that, that you could say there are similarities um, with uh, folks from Latin America, Mesoamerica, um, and, and, and it's different, right, from Black communities in the Deep South, for example. Um, so it's a very nuanced question. And I think that is what has made it very difficult uh, to bring our communities together, because we're all, you know, just hanging on by a thread to survive from day to day. Um, and, you know, these, these diseases that come from this industry and the trauma, you know, of, of living through a climate disaster and having to leave your homeland uh, and give, you know, everything up is, is extremely disruptive. Um, and has lasting, you know, impacts on on you and and future generations. So, I think I think that that requires more study, right? It requires more compassion, more humility, more understanding. Um, the RGV, the borderlands, have become a war zone. You know, it's heavily militarized, um, and 
it has turned, you know, communities there against their own relatives, right? Their own families. Um, and, and there's always ways of creating wedges, right? Uh, between communities because of the, the economic need to survive. Um, so capitalism, you know, and the way that we provide for ourselves and each other um, is definitely a big part of, of the problem. Um, and that impacts Latino communities and, you know, African-American communities, Black communities, and all migrants differently. You know, the fact that folks, if they get here um, and don't have legal status, that removes them from any kind of support from the system, you know, after disaster strikes. It removes them from the ability to, to ask for help um, before a storm. Um, and it makes them, you know, reliant on churches, makes them reliant on NGOs, makes them reliant on other, other people. Um, and, and that's, that's a little different, right? Than, uh, than those who are here um, and are citizens, you know, and, and have rights. But that doesn't mean that even those communities receive those rights either, <laughs> you know? And uh, and so, yeah, I think I think that question specifically is important. It's important to think about how we ask it, um, and that our our attempt to answer it um, is mindful um, that we are we are all victims of a system, you know, that has been uh, created uh, to target our communities and. And, and so that's, you know, that's where we can come together to, to change those laws um, that exist currently and to build better fellowship amongst each other. Um, and that goes, that goes for all of our, our relatives, right? Our, our Asian brothers and sisters, you know, our Caucasian brothers and sisters that also live in, you know, low income communities and are, are targeted as well. Um, yeah. I hope I hope that answers a little. <laughs> it does. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Stephanie. So on that note, when we're thinking about how to come together as a community to advocate for issues of environmental justice, um, what can the Latinx community learn from other communities, such as the Native and Indigenous or the Asian American um, communities fighting against environmental racism? What you got, Stephanie? Go ahead. What I got? Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. So when I think about um, a community that I've also spent some time with uh, and that I deeply, deeply, deeply admire is actually the Haudenosaunee. So the Haudenosaunee are the, um, uh, in the translation of that is the Iroquois Confederacy, um, in particular, the Mohawk Nation of Akwesasne. They straddle the New York and Canadian borderland. And they were in the 1950s. Well, so, so traditionally the Mohawk had always, always fished and trapped. That was, um, those are their two, that, that was how they sustained their community for thousands of years um, in, that, in that area. But in the 1950s, the, um, uh, the, there was a big dam built and uh, the, the dam drowned out all of the muskrats and the beavers. So the, suddenly they could no longer trap. And then um, Alcoa, GM, and Reynolds moved in uh, to take advantage of all the cheap electricity from the dams. And they built these major uh, multinational corporation businesses. Um, and uh, starting from the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s until the 80s. Uh, oh, and also there, the, these, these companies were like right up against the lines of the nation of Akwesasne, the Mohawk nation. And um, for about 25 years, close to 30 years, they dumped all their PCB laden waste into all of the surrounding river streams, which killed all the fish and tumored the fish and um, made this fish very sick. So now then suddenly Mohawk were also not able to fish. And so their two primary sources of sustainability were totally wiped out. Um, and so what I deeply appreciate about the Haudenosaunee is they, have never given up the fight. They are 
um, extraordinary organizers. And they do, they're not afraid to do really drastic things like um, actually how you even uh, go from um, the, the, the way that you cross in that particular region, there's the St. Lawrence River separates the United States from Canada. So in order to cross, you go over these bridges. And, um, and actually the Mohawk built a lot of these bridges. Um, anyway, they shut them down all of the time. They cause you know, major havoc <laughs> shutting down these bridges. Um, and, and, but they, they, they don't care. They do this. Um, they, um, you know, when uh, the EPA um, forced, um, I think it was Reynolds, or no, no, it was GM. Uh, they, they had GM, G, although the former GM site has become a Superfund site. And so um, GM was fined, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And part of that money was specifically earmarked for the Haudenosaunee and uh, for the Mohawk Nation in particular. And, um, and, but it was, a, it was a tepid remediation plan. And to make a point, some Mohawk went and got, back, they got their back hose and they chained themselves to the steering wheel. And then they like burst through the gates of, you know, the Superfund site and got the backhoe and started like digging up dirt. And like, we're like, see, it's not that hard to remediate, you know, <laughs> and like moving stuff around themselves. And, um, and they got, you know, major international news play for this. So, I think that uh, I really admire how they have, um, how they've really thrown themselves into this activist movement. And uh, my, my dream in writing all the agents and saints was that it would start a conversation um, one side of the border or speaking to the next side of the border. Um, and I, I feel like, I feel like that is something that absolutely needs to happen. You know, re representatives from all of these different communities need to come together and come up with a, a, a plan. That would be my dream to see happen. Yes. <laughs> I'll be quick. Um, the first thing is we, we have to be anti-racist, right? <laughs> I mean, that's pretty simple. Um, if we're to combat environmental racism, we have to, we have to learn to be anti-racism, to anti-racist. And, and there is anti-Blackness in our communities, right? There's anti-immigrant in our communities, Um and there's, you know, Islamophobia, you know, there are a lot of racist ideologies uh, that are part of our upbringing, right, just by being raised here in the U.S. And, and I think, you know, that's another area where I try and understand the importance of the cultural work that I've been a part of, right, this whole fight for ethnic studies um, and, and the attack on, you know, critical race theory or any book or idea that is carried by people of color or LGBT trans communities. Um, you know, there, there's a lot to learn from each other. And, and I think on the environmental side that uh, indigenous ways of life, you know, are, are doing things and have always done things with, you know, balance as a priority, not profit, balance. And, you know, there, there have been times, you know, where, where they have messed up too, um, but there's perpetual growth and learning and indigenous people are all over, all over the globe, right? They're not just folks here in the U S or central and South America there are African indigenous communities, you know, Asian indigenous communities. Um, and we know that biodiversity is strongest in these communities. Um, and, and, and that's really important to understand. And I think we all have to learn to live with those priorities in mind. Um, and, and that takes, that takes real, you know, decolonial work <laughs> uh, ourselves with our families um, and our lifestyles and uh, and that has to be taught right because it's it's not something um, that just happens it has to be taught and uh, and that's going to require you know a presence in our schools you know a presence in 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 our politic um, and certainly in our in our culture yeah, sometimes it, you start you start at home to make 
to make big change, you start at home. Um, Brian, you mentioned earlier that sometimes when uh, you talk to folks about environmental issues, uh, their eyes gloss over a little bit. Um, so keeping attention and focus to these issues can sometimes be kind of difficult because a lot of these, con not all, but a lot of the consequences happen over time, right? They're not immediately tangible. Um, and you both touched on this in one way or another, but can you elaborate on how environmental justice is connected to other issues of equity and justice within the Latinx community? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Ooh. I mean, I've been doing this for about 20, 25 years now. And so I have the luxury of being able to say, aha, I told you <laughs> now, right? Uh, and sometimes that's not in a joking way either, right? You just see it, like people get cancer, um, people get sick, um, you get sick. And unfortunately, our brains are not designed to think in that way, um, to make decisions today about things that may happen 20 years down the road. Um, so again, that takes discipline, it takes education, and it takes, you know, respect, respect for yourself, respect for your family, respect for your environment, right, that we all share. Um, and, and there are many ways to do that, many, many ways to do that. And they don't often, you know, have anything to do with the environment at all, you know, just uh, taking time to care for vulnerable populations, the elders, you know, children, um, and, and knowing what their needs are so that they can have a, you know, high quality of life, right? Um, there's, there's a saying in, in Latin America called uh, the good life, right? Where you're from, Anna, the good life. And... <clears throat> And we have a colleague, Patricia, who wrote about the good life. Um, and, and a lot of it is just, you know, deeply in, in, rooted in our cultures. And that changes once, once you become, you know, part of this American system, right? The American dream um, kind of glazes over the responsibilities that we have to each other. Um, and and idolizes you know the individual to a point where we learn to be selfish, right? And we learn to take 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 take. Um, and so those are those are all areas I think where there can be, you know, important lessons um, that that we have to share with each other. You know, folks who come to this country are excited and want to be part of that opportunity, right? Um, and that's great. And folks who are, are here, you know, often are, are, you know, um, <laughs> confused about what this opportunity is because we haven't ever seen it. <laughs> um, and yet, you know, we can, we can succeed and, and be, you know, um, folks that make, great deal of money, um, but it comes at a sacrifice. And, uh, and I think that that creates a lot of conflict, you know, within uh, our communities, because uh, we don't like to step on each other. We don't like to, we do think about the consequences, right, of the of our actions and the places that we work and all of that. Um, but uh, I think I'm going in circles now. So I'm going to stop. Thanks, Brian. Stephanie, is there anything you want to add? All good. Wonderful. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask one more question before we move on to the Q&A portion. Um, I just want to remind our audience, if you have any questions for Brian or Stephanie, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and submit the question there. Um, I can go ahead and ask it on your behalf. Um, so when we're talking about these issues related to environmental injustice and racism, it can sometimes be really hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. 
especially when you factor in issues related to climate change that can affect and will affect every person on this planet, right? As you said, Stephanie, earlier. Um, so issues related to the environment sometimes take this more doom and gloom route. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, que puedo hacer yo, soy una persona, like, what can I do? I'm just an individual. Um, so how can people, and particularly young people, advocate for environmental justice in the Latinx community? Yeah, wow. I feel like we've had so many extraordinary examples of, of how people are doing just that. You know, the, the person that comes to my mind just immediately is um, Jamie Margolin. You know, she was only 15 years old when she founded the, uh, the Climate Action Organization Zero Hour. And she did this after watching what happened in Washington State with the wildfires, what, what happened with the, the response to Hurricane Maria. Uh, in, in Puerto Rico and so many dead and um, just the, the cruelty with which Trump, you know, remember that throwing the paper towels at the, I mean, just, you know, just this total disaster that was happening. Um, and so she, at, at the age 15, was enraged by all of this and, and decided to do something about it and started this amazing organization where they do, um, you know, all throughout the pandemic, they were doing Zoom trainings for youth activists all over the world, like how to go in and, and try to find local issues, but use these particular steps to bring about campaigns. So I feel that, um, I mean, that that is actually where I do find the hope is among the young people, people like Greta Thunberg. And, you know, I feel like all of all of the communities that I've gone into, um, I've always seen young people standing on the lines and doing the, these big, big actions and big protests. And so, yeah, that that is what gives me a lot of faith. Yeah. What do you think, Brian? I uh, I was just reading a book, Fresh Banana Leaves, um, and I forget the author's name. It's like I have the book behind me, but there's there's an incredible amount of people writing about these issues that we're talking about now and and it and it starts with you know the stories that we've both shared just thinking about yourself your home your community where you come from um and you know maybe it starts with that exercise of writing what did i see what did i smell what did i taste i smelt a lot of bad things growing up <laughs> and they made me feel really sick and i that stuck with me right? That stuck with me. So when I was able to connect the source of those smells to how I was feeling, that drove me, right, to do what I do now. Um, and it's, it's just, you know, that simple. It's that simple of being open and honest um, to the feelings, right, and all of the, the data that you're receiving from your five senses, uh, we're all scientists, we're all philosophers, we're all writers, we're all poets, um, and we need to allow ourselves to be that uh, and share it and share it with others. Um, I, uh, I said Patricia earlier, I was thinking of Priscilla Ibarra. Um, you know, this is another writer who is telling incredible stories about, about this topic, right, in different ways, in their own voice. Um, and we need more of us so that we can reach more people. Um, a lot of the, the, the leaders, right, in the EJ movement um, that we see all the time are men, men of color, um, but there are a hell of a lot of women of color, you know, and most of the folks that, uh, that I have, have learned from, um, the men included, were activated by women of color. <laughs> Uh, including my dad, right? Including Dr. Bullard. Um, and so it's great to see Susie. I know Susie uh, Canales and I know the Leonels, you know, they're, they're a couple, right? Leonel and his wife. Um, so there are folks doing this work, find them and support them, support them, you know, and then discover yourself. Where do I sit? Where do I fit in this, in this, uh, you know, movement? and and you know jump in that's really great advice thank you brian thank you stephanie um so we're gonna move to uh the q a portion 
of uh, this event. So I have a question for y'all. Um, the environmental justice movement has built grassroots has built grassroots activism through engagement in local issues, underpinned by a global infrastructure, to be sure, but having direct impacts on the embodied existence of people in specific communities. Do you have any thoughts on how to unite people and inspire activism around the more dis dispersed threat of climate change, which is driven also by the fossil fuel industry, as were the health issues that y'all discussed? Let me know if you need me to repeat the question. I see it in the chat. I think I think it's uh it's important to know who's asking, right? Because the answer to that depends really on on the individual. Um, but there are many general ways that you can participate. You know, find those folks who are doing this work already um and and support them um if you can't find anyone who are the vulnerable populations in in the community that you live in how is climate change showing up right i'm in sacramento right now and i've been told like they had 115 degree temperatures here that's wild um and 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 just knowing that you know, you know, I thought, how can anyone survive that has to live outside, right? That is houseless. Um, and, and what is that doing to the, the environment? Um, when we had a drought in Houston and, and Texas is in one right now, you know, we lost thousands of trees um, in one summer. Um, so just being able to see these things and training ourselves to pay attention, I think is, is really helpful. And that was really beautifully put. And again, I think it's important to just, um, you, you, you don't have to go looking far. Uh, so you will find all of these issues in your community and then just evaluate where you are in your own life in that moment. And what, what do you love to do? And then find what you love to do and turn that toward justice. Um, and so for, you know, for me, it was writing and for Brian, it initially was videography and for you, maybe it's dance for you. Maybe it's music for you. It's, um, it can be, it can be anything. It can be, you know, if you are trained to be an accountant, my God, I mean, there are plenty of, you know, local community organizations that could really use an accountant pro bono, right? <laughs> or if you're a lawyer, or if you're a doctor, you know, whatever, whatever you're studying right now, whatever your expertise is right now, how can you do that for justice? Thank you, Stephanie, Brian. Um, so our next question, how do you see the topics discussed today reflected in the cur current status of Jackson, Mississippi? And for just a little bit of context for our audience, um, Jackson, Mississippi has been suffering a really bad water crisis. They haven't had clean water, I believe since August, it's, it's, it's been a while. Um, and there's currently doesn't seem like there's an end in sight. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, without like diving into the, the local politics or the state politics, because I don't know them well enough, but I I know that, you know, there's racism involved here, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and part of it is from many decades of racism, you know, being enacted through policies um, that have allowed for a failing infrastructure of water you know, to be delivered to these communities. Um, and I've seen it in Texas, right? Where you have two political parties fighting for money um, that is, is given to the state after a disaster or in a situation like this about how to spend the money, where it should go. Um, meanwhile, the communities are waiting, you know, without water um, and, that happens so many times. It's happening, you know, in Puerto Rico right now, right? It's still happening in Houston from Hurricane Harvey. You know, there are millions of dollars that have not been <laughs> allocated. The city of Houston, Harris County, had to fight the state. Um, a community of individuals had to sue the state, you know, to make these funds 
um, available. And, and that takes years and years and years. Meanwhile, they are doing without. Um, and so, you know, what we've seen is a growth in mutual aid, rapid response groups. Um, again, communities having to rely on NGOs, um, charity from others, and, and that can be a powerful moment to build solidarity and allies, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't fall on them to provide that support, right? Um, and, and so that, that is totally like a, a really good example of where we're headed, right? When Stephanie says it's coming for, for you, um, it might not be, you know, your own personal health. It could be a big, you know, infrastructure um, problem in the county that you live in or the city, you know, or the colonia, right, which has nothing. Um, Oof, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and uh, speaking of hell, <laughs> uh, when when you mentioned that uh, that that metaphor, it actually reminded me of of a book. I I, th I think it's really you know, I think it's really important to to um, to keep our soul strong and our spirit strong throughout all of this because this is really really, really heavy talk. And um, I just want to point out a couple of resources that have done that for me, um, and that is the work of Rebecca Solnit. Um, she has some just really, really powerful books. Um, one is called, I think it's called Hope in the Dark. Is that right? Hope in the Dark. And the other one is Paradise. It's either Built in Hell or something like that. It's something similar to that. Paradise Built in Hell. Um, and the, the, the first book, she actually made it like was handing out free copies. You know, she was um, enabling free downloads in the beginning part of the pandemic, you know, just trying to um, you know, rally, rally the troops, rally the spirit, because we're not going to accomplish much if we can't get out of bed because we're so like catatonically depressed with what's happening. Um, the second thing that, that this, this other book that she wrote is amazing. Um, thank you. Yeah. Paradise built in hell. So powerful, this book. So, um, paradise built in hell is actually about, um, you know, we feel like in the moment when we're in deep crisis, that that is when people are killing one another over resources and everything is deeply catastrophic. Um, and, and, and how do we have that idea? We have that idea through media, we have this idea, you know, but, but what she actually very diligently shows is that it's actually the moments of total catastrophe when human beings really unite and all other dividing issues are momentarily dropped and they really, really come through for one another. And she, spy, she um, as examples, she goes to uh, the earthquake in Mexico City, which was in what, 84, 87, some, somewhere in the mid eighties. Um, they had this vast catastrophic earthquake and, um, and people even were like nostalgic for that time, even though so many people were killed and so many buildings destroyed and it just destroyed a lot of infrastructure. But the, the, you know, the Chilangos <laughs> were united in that moment and everyone came together and really, really, really helped one another in a very meaningful way. Um, she also writes about Hurricane Katrina, which, you know, I, mean, I remember watching those videos and feeling like, oh my God, it's, it is descending into help because those are the kind of images that we were seeing. Um, but in fact, that's when all these like mutual aid societies were coming together and people were really like organizing. So I, 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 I do feel, you know, the actions of human beings have gotten us into this situation, but I, I, I will maintain my hope in the dark with Rebecca Solnit is that it will also be human beings that get us out of it again, because we have, we have proven time and again that we can make it through together these, these catastrophes. That is a beautiful way to end this conversation. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Brian. Um, yeah, I, I want to thank the Duke Human Rights, um, the Duke Human Rights Center for hosting an important conversation and all the co-sponsors this evening. Uh, thank you for our audience for tuning in. A lot of these conversations can be difficult to have, but having people like y'all invested and, 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 and caring and listening, um, it's really important to start that first step of um, making change in the communities that are near and dear in our hearts. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Corinne just to see if there's any closing remarks that she wants to give. 
No, I want to thank um, Brian and Stephanie for being with us. Thank you, Anna, for for moderating. It was an excellent discussion. Um, I feel um, I feel hopeful um, for some positive change, and I hope everyone else in the audience does as well. So, thank you all for being here with us tonight, and um, I hope you all have a good evening. Stay safe um, against whatever climate havoc might um, unfold but um thank you all gracias for your for your time and your and your your work that you're doing for our communities thank you